was discussing auroras. Oh, sh- auroras. Okay. The aurora. The aurora refers to the rays of bright colors in the night sky near the north and south poles. In the northern hemisphere, it's called the aurora borealis. And in the southern hemisphere, it's called the aurora australis. You've probably seen pictures of it. It's quite beautiful. It took centuries to figure out what's behind these beautiful colors in the night skies. Oh, yeah. In the early 1700s, scientists proposed that there was an electric current that stretched between the North and South Poles, and that if this electric current was disturbed, an aurora would form. Others postulated that the phenomenon was caused by light that refracted off glaciers and snow in the Arctic. (laughs) Then in the 1800s, scientific interest in Earth's magnetic field, in strange variations in Earth's magnetic field, led to the observation that the biggest magnetic disturbances coincided with dramatic auroras, and also with the timing of the most intense sunspot activity. Sunspots were first observed centuries earlier, temporary dark spots on the face of the sun. They're gaseous, highly magnetic regions that move across the sun's surface. Sunspot cycles are at their height every 11 years, and so are aurora cycles. They peak together. By the early 20th century, it was found that Earth's magnetic field is constantly being bombarded by charged particles streaming from the sun. We call it solar wind. And do I need to tell you when the solar wind is especially strong? Yep, every 11 years, when the magnetic activity of sunspots is peaking. The charged particles interact with Earth's magnetic field, and they're pulled toward the north and south poles. Some of them make it into our upper atmosphere, where they collide with atoms, with oxygen and nitrogen atoms. This collision causes the atoms to light up, to glow. Different types of atoms glowing different colors. And this is what's happening when we're seeing an aurora. Now let's jump ahead to the early 1970s and a discovery made using a device called a coronagraph. A coronagraph attaches to a telescope and acts like a disk that blocks out the sun. It creates an artificial solar eclipse, you could say, when you're looking through the telescope. This makes the sun's corona, or outer atmosphere, much easier to observe. Now, it's true that whenever there's a total eclipse of the sun, you can see the corona, that outer white circle surrounding the sun. But how long does a total solar eclipse last? Less than 10 minutes, and they occur maybe once a year. With a coronagraph, you can observe the corona continuously, anytime you want. And during the early 1970s, using a coronagraph mounted on an orbiting satellite, we witnessed what are called coronal mass ejections, or CMEs for short. Oh, my God. So, coronal mass ejections, what are those? Well, they're huge magnetized gas clouds that are thrown from the sun during a big atmospheric storm. They erupt from the sun over the course of several hours. These huge clouds are made of billions of tons of those charged particles that rush toward the Earth at incredibly high speeds. This mass reaches our planet's magnetic field in anywhere from just several hours to a few days. So, we found that during CMEs, with their enormous ejections of particles from the sun, auroras are particularly intense. Now, as we've said, we can predict peaks in sunspot activity, but so far, we can't say the same for CMEs. We don't know when they'll occur or how large they'll be. But what would be the advantage in knowing that? Well, throughout history, we've noticed correlations between aurora intensity and technical problems, uh, disruptions, first with compasses going awry, then when we developed telegraph systems, they were affected and then telephone systems and shortwave radio systems. Today, even whole electrical power stations. For example, in 1989, there was a really intense magnetic storm initiated by a flare-up on the sun, and it caused electricity to go out for 12 hours in Quebec, Canada. Wow. Oh, oh boy. All right. I was really excited because I was like, oh, this is going to be a very interesting one about auroras. And then I'm like, oh, God, the scientific version. This is killing me. Okay. Not too bad, right? All right. Uh, Let's see. What is the main purpose of the lecture? To compare current theories about an astronomical phenomenon? 
to describe the growth of knowledge about an astronomical phenomenon. I kind of like B. To illustrate how astronomical theories based on incorrect assumptions can lead to important discoveries. What? No. D, to demonstrate the astronomers are able to predict event. Fuck no. Nothing about the sun, nothing about Earth. So we're comparing or we're describing. What do you like, Gabriella? Uh, describing. Please. That's right. I love it too. Let's go, let's go, let's go. All right. We got it correct. Correct the mundo. Number two. According to the professor, what theories were proposed in the 1700s to account for the occurrence of auroras? Select a two answers. Um, now, I wrote 1700s. Um, what theories were proposed? It was something about electrical current between North and South. Yeah, so... so I love D. Wait, don't tell me. Uh, electric currents, he says. Mm-hmm. Ours... Uh, so D and, 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 and light, snow, ar arctic, and sunspots. It would be D and DNA. He That's talks right. About and he took up about snow and light and that's right so a it was caused by light refracting off ice and snow and it says something about the light off glaciers uh, and then so he that's ice. About the current so be a and d yeah it wasn't about gases and the cmes were later cmes yeah. were much later so very good d and a fantastico very good all right, let's keep it going. Let's keep it pushing. Question number three. Why does the professor mention the duration of solar eclipses? So let me see. Okay, duration. Something about 11 years, okay? Oh, well, yeah. Solar wind, 11 years. It's back in magnetic fields. The magnetic activity of the sun peaking. Okay. I a, to demonstrate the importance of the coronagraph. Hmm. B, to describe the effects of solar eclipses on auroras. Ooh. No, 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 no. I don't like B. Solar oh, eclipses? Wow. Absolutely not. C, to support a conclusion about the connection between sunspot cycles and other solar events. Sunspot cycles. And he mentioned something about coronas. Corona. Yeah, he did. Right here. Block the sun. Uh oh, he did mention solar eclipse too. So I wrote everything right over here. Okay, why dis dur duration of solar eclipses? 10 minutes to once a year. So I, I think it would be B because he mentioned solar eclipse on Aurora. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it only occurs 10 minutes once a year, right? Let's see. Ah, uh, A, to demonstrate the importance of the bullshit ass coronagraph which was mentioned in my thesis right up here. Yeah, it was something about that, so. Yeah, as a research tool. Okay, whatever. The coronavirus. Okay, all right, let's keep it going. Number four, how do sunspots contribute to auroras? Um, Increase the intensity? Magnetic? Yeah, but... Uh, I, aurora intense, aurora Erupt over, made of tons of charged particles, rush towards Earth fast. Yeah. Auroras are intense. Okay, sunspots bombard Earth with oxygen and nitrogen atoms. Well, I don't remember. It does bombard, but I don't know if it was with oxygen and nitrogen. No, let me see, no. Sunspots cause temperature changes at Earth's poles, no. Emit charged particles that collide with atoms in Earth's upper atmosphere? I think it's B. It could be B or C, but I don't like C. What do you think? A, no. A, to increase the intense? Nah. Mm -mm. Well, I mean B because he mentioned something about atoms, charged particles, in high speed, several hours. I think it's B. Yeah, and the thing is, it says rush towards Earth fast. Reaches magnetic field which would be Earth's upper atmosphere? Shit, I have no idea. But I, I like B more than C. Bam, good job. All right, because it rushes towards Earth's atmosphere. Now, he did say bombard, but I did not write down oxygen or nitrogen, so I didn't like C. 
What do you think? You look lost. No, I'm fine. I'm okay, just... okay, all right. Because I thought you were like, ay, ay, ay. Okay, all right, good. Let's go on to the next one. Number five. What point does a professor make when he talks about disruptions to technology? How about the auras? auras technology are. disrupt telegraph, telephone, invaders, power station, magnetic storms. CMEs on the sun can have far reaching effect. I love C. B, observing or activity has proven to be a better way to predict. Fuck no. Disruptions are more prevalent in the northern hemisphere. Nope. Didn't write that down either. I love C. CMEs and other magnetic activity on the sun can have. Wait, CMEs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can have far reaching effects. Yeah. What do you think? Because D, it says most information about aura intensity has been obtained through observation with naked eye. Really? Okay, yeah, I'm looking at the sun and I can see the activity. Yeah, man, shut the fuck up. It's bullshit. Okay, so I'm going with C. Bam, let's go. All right, did you write anything down in regards to C? I wrote, I wrote a technology this chops telegraph, telephones, radios, power stations, and that's it. Okay. All right. All right. Well, let's go into the last to, to the last one. Why does the professor say this? Okay, here we go. Let's listen. Why does the professor say this? And do I need to tell you when the solar wind is especially strong? Just to make a point. He said, oh, every 10 years, what he said, 10 years or 11 years, whatever he had said. He hopes that one of the students will explain the answer. No. The answer I think should be obvious, B. B? Yeah, B sounds right. Yeah, because it's, uh, yeah. He does not remember he covered, yeah, D's terrible. And C, he thinks the point is not relevant. Bullshit. B, absolutely. No chance. Good job. 